Welcome to today's episode of the Support Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Marquen, Community Manager at Sentisum. Today, my guest is Justin Rosenti, Head of Support at Shopify Logistics. Justin's going to be taking us through the analysis that he does on CSAP, best response time, resolution time, and ticket types to identify areas of improvement, both for the agent's performance and for the product. He's also going to be giving us his advice for any other support leaders who are looking to reduce their reply times. Welcome, Justin. Thank you very much for joining me on today's episode. Yeah, thank you for having me. I would just love it if you could start by giving us a little bit of an introduction on yourself and your role at Shopify. Yeah, happy to do so. So my background is in management consulting, and I joined the Shopify slash deliver team in March, February, March of 2020. So actually, I went to the office for one week before San Francisco shut down for the COVID pandemic. I started out working on the team focused on growth strategy, and as a focus of that role, working with our account managers, uh, identified the opportunity to work more closely with our support team to actually enable our account managers to have growth-oriented conversations because all of their touch points with our merchants were focusing on ongoing support issues. So at the end of that year, working with our co-founders, we moved the support team within the growth team, and I started to lead that team from there. And that's been the case all the way through now, though, of course, in 2022, Deliver was acquired by Shopify, becoming the new Shopify logistics, encompassing both the Deliver and SFN fulfillment brands. And I've continued to lead the combined merchant support team for Shopify logistics since that acquisition. That sounds great. And you just mentioned that support sits within the growth team. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we made the move to basically keep all of our, generally speaking, client facing, but for us, merchant facing teams within the growth team. So everyone talking to our merchants, everyone managing those relationships was a part of one team. You're the second person I've spoken to in the last sort of week that has it set up that way where support sits somewhat under revenue. Is that because of managing the teams or is that sort of because support feeds into growth in your opinion? Yeah, I think I've seen and heard of the move from other support leaders as well. It definitely seems to be a direction of, as an engine of our growth, we want to really focus on managing our client experience and managing the touch points with support is a really important part of that. So while I don't think you have a lot of customer support leads saying this is the number I'm accountable for on revenue, it is increasingly being seen as an important input towards retaining, building great relationships with your clients, which is, of course, an input to your revenue outcomes. Absolutely, totally agree. There's been so much work being done recently that I've certainly seen in the world of support where people have been trying to showcase the support team as a value centre and as a revenue driver when it comes to things like retention and upsells and support being part of a service. So the fact that some people are now moving it to within growth and within revenue kind of says to me that that's taking, which I love. Yeah, a great way to position support away from being a cost to be minimized within, say, operations and instead a driver of value for the business. Absolutely. Totally agree. So when we last spoke, we were discussing some key metrics, CSAT and response time and time to resolution. And you had quite a few really interesting insights. The topic of this podcast is on the amazing things that you've done with your reply time and your your best response times. But before we get onto that, can we start by just talking about how you analyze your CSAT scores to identify improvement opportunities? Yeah, so I think we we touched on this a little bit previously, which is across our metrics, just making sure we really equip our leads and managers to have the ability to deep dive those metrics themselves independently. So with CSAT, for example, each of the individual teams having their monthly, weekly goals, tracking, And performing that deep dive to understand exactly by week, by month, what were my opportunities to improve CSAT, going all the way from this was the top level score for the team for the quarter, down to the individual leads looking at their CSAT outcomes by week, reviewing individual negative CSAT, and continuing to triage what is our opportunity to actually move the needle here and improve this. A lot of goal setting quarter to quarter where our leads are doing and taking advantage of this negative CSAT review to basically say, okay, if I change how we're managing these types of conversations, if I work with these particular agents, here's my potential improvement opportunity on CSAT, essentially kind of building that improvement bridge and resetting where we think we can move those goals in the future. Okay, great. So you're 
working to improve on your CSAT as a team, but also on an individual basis? Yeah, so I would say specifically, we're just really trying to distribute the problem as much as we can. So rather than one person looking at the very top aligned support number for a month, having all of the team leads keeping track of that score at their team level and running these initiatives saying, I'm going to take my CSAT from 90% to 92% uh, over the next three months. And here's how I'm going to get there. So getting a lot of people working on that problem, which just requires one that we understand and equip people to solve that problem. Here's how you can analyze these individual CSATs and start to identify opportunities to reduce those. And as well, providing the tools, actually being able to go do that drill down say by quarter, by month, my team, by agent, and then identify those opportunities. Of course, you're able to look at it quite broadly, but then go down into that more granular detail. One thing that I find super interesting about CSAT is that it's supposed to be a satisfaction response where the customer rates their experience with the agent. How well did they handle this conversation? Did they give you everything you wanted, et cetera? But lots of people misuse it, so I've seen. Not sure if it will be the same in your industry, but certainly in B2C, people will leave a negative CSAT response, even if the agent has done everything they can because they're upset with the issue itself. Do you see that very much in your industry? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's a commonality across support in many industries where I think this process kind of lines up with that reality of some CSAT just indicating I wasn't happy I had to talk with you about this at all is when those individual leads are doing this exercise of here's my potential improvement opportunity, they're not doing an arbitrary goal setting exercise. I'm going to improve this 10 or 20%. But they've reviewed all of the individual examples of these are the negative CSAT I'm receiving. Uh, these, This is the type of CSAT all of these are classified as. And one of the examples we actually do classify our CSAT is just frustration. I was upset that this thing happened. Other items are product or policy limitations. Those are harder to fix, but they're items we can move to address with our product team or review our own internal policies. And then finally, there's just ticket response itself, which is what I actually, what the agent actually said or shared on the ticket likely led to or made it more likely that this was potentially to be a negative CSAT outcome. So by doing that ongoing triage and review, then we can do a realistic goal setting exercise. This is my compressible versus incompressible improvement opportunity. Yeah, I like that you segment it like that. That allows the agent to sort of control the controllables. And do you then sort of work with product teams or wider teams if you identify recurring themes that are coming through in CSAT that are relating to the product? Yeah, absolutely. We work very closely with our product teams to share if we're seeing particular trends within our negative CSAT, as well, we'll work with the overall organization. A good example of that was when I first started leading the support team, the number one driver of negative CSAT related to the payout policies we had around lost in transit orders. And so we reviewed that policy to try and better align it to merchant expectations of what they should be reimbursed if a package didn't actually make it to the end buyer. Right, I see. Okay, that's a great use of analysing those scores to work with different departments. And that actually brings me on to my next question, which was, could you tell me a little bit about the relationship between support and product as a result of the wider analysis that you do? Yeah, so our support and product teams work very closely. In fact, a lot of our, a lot of how we as a support team are structured uh, lines up with how our product teams are structured. So At Deliver, we have always structured our product teams with a functional focus. So rather than splitting, say, front-end engineers, back-end engineers, it's based on the part of the product that you support. Uh, And similarly, our support teams have specializations with parts of the product. And so we're able to have weekly, bi-weekly touch points with the support team that focuses on one part of the product and the product team that has that same focus as well. And they're able to have a more direct conversation of here's what you need to be aware of coming down the pipeline. Here's what we're hearing from merchants, et cetera. What else do you need us tracking in our ticket issue tags that we can give you better feedback on certain issues? Uh, And as well, just kind of continuing to have that ongoing dialogue of, hey, this is clearly a top of mind merchant pain point the last month since we've done that. How are we going to address this, improve this next quarter? Oh, I see. So you've got sort of specialized segments or specialized agents and areas of the product where they know a lot about this specific part of the service or product and then they can align on those issues specifically 
Correct. Yeah. And within logistics, it's a very complex space. The, the requirements to just send in product to a fulfillment network, it's not just box it up and send it in. It's make sure the barcode's legible, make sure the box is labeled this way, the items are protected this way, different caveats based on the actual properties of the product you're trying to ship, scheduling, managing the shipment, fulfillment, uh, all of these things like have a high amount of investment required on both sides to get right and a fair amount of complexity that is fundamentally just unrealistic for an agent to understand across all of the different focuses of our product. And so instead we have a little bit of segmentation of our knowledge areas so that our agents can get really deep knowledge, work more closely with our product and provide great answers even across complex issues to the merchants coming into our support team. That actually does make total sense because if you're on the receiving end, you don't really think about all of that that goes into the logistics of sort of getting things from A to B. There is, as you said, there's the packaging, the, the printing of the labels, the actually getting the merchandise, the delivery. There's so many elements that you need to have all kind of line up for things to go well. So then researching where something might have gone wrong, that could potentially be quite complicated. Absolutely. And in, sometimes it even feels like just the part people are familiar with, with the actual fulfillment, getting it from our warehouse to the end buyer is, is one of the easier parts. Getting it into the network, integrating your store marketplace with our network can oftentimes be more complex elements. Cool. Well, that's taught me a little bit about sort of logistics. So now I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about the amazing achievement that you've had with reducing your response time. I think you told me that in Q4 of 2020, your 90th percentile response time, so the, the time that was happening at the most sort of the highest 10% of responses was a week and the median response time was 24 to 36 hours. In one year, you've managed to bring that 90th percentile response time down from one week to 14 hours and your median down to half an hour, which is super, super impressive. If anyone listening has struggled to keep up with the maths on that, that's a roughly a 90% reduction. What steps did you take to achieve that? Yeah, so a lot of continuing to work with the amazing leads that were in place and helping them triage, like, here are the opportunities. Here are where we're sending in longer responses. Here's how we need to adjust our team to meet this demand. And helping advocate for those teams to get the resources that they needed. So forming a better understanding of the ticket demand versus actual agent staffing requirements versus the previous estimations that have been done, which were essentially like overly optimistic and thinking through how the demand of tickets coming in, which are these random fluctuations, different hours, different times of the week would match up with our agent capacity, which is this more flat block of total seats per hour that we can actually make available at a moment in time and understanding that we had to staff to the potential spikes if we were going to avoid building up these large backlogs and how we eventually moved towards getting to that better understanding really was just building out some ticket to demand forecast models and starting to hire against those staffing models versus these just kind of ticket algebra models that have been, been done before. Right. So the actual capacity of the agents that you had was a big driver of that higher response time where you just physically didn't have enough agents to cover those spikes. Essentially, it was it was just a capacity bust. It was a major contributor. Some internal operations, things we continued to improve. We continued to partner with product and get faster, more efficient on some of our more complex tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I say a lot of what I did that year was really just giving a really strong team the resources that they needed. That's yeah, that's great because there there is those two elements that I think a lot of contact centers struggle with is that trying to get the budget for more staff is really, really difficult. So was there any element of sort of tying the difficulty you were having for those response times back to revenue or back to turn in any way to make that argument? Yeah, I think it was very clear even without more of a factor model. So even without saying this response time leads to this churn, it was just clearly the number one pain point for a lot of our merchants at that point in time for the business. I mean, it is what drove that change in our support structures that all of our 
merchant facing teams, all of our account managers, every call they were on with our merchants, this is all they were able to talk about is it's taking me three days to get an answer yeah. on a ticket at best, right? Or, or a week on, on some of these, some areas we were more backlogged. And then as those response times were able to change, we basically took support, which was uh, cited as the number one pain point at the end of 2020 by a lot of our merchants to actually, when we did interviews going into the acquisition cited as a major strength of the merchants, we did those background interviews with. Fantastic. That is super important in a number of ways. Obviously, for one, you've got that level of frustration with people who aren't getting the response quick enough. But then you have this knock-on effect where if someone's not getting a response, they'll continue to send more messages. They'll continue to keep calling. They'll drive that volume up even higher. And then other issues are going to get buried because everyone's calling is saying, I can't get hold of you. I can't hear from you. I need my query. So then the other things that are fixable perhaps in the product or in the website or something aren't really seen as the loudest voices. Yeah, you also see the effect coming through of if everything is delayed in that way, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of issues or a lot of asks from merchants are starting to get escalated. They're reaching out to their account manager saying, this is critical, or or, there's no way I can continue working if we don't solve this really quickly. And then those are coming in as escalated requests that we're pushing to the top of the queue, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem of the overall backlog. We're just continuing to insert other things towards the front of the queue. So if you're able to just be resolving a lot of ongoing issues in a timely manner, you are minimizing those escalations that are building up that backlog as well. Yeah. Well, what an achievement that you were able to reduce it that much in only a year, especially when that was sort of, so Q4 2022, that would still have been when everything had been going on with COVID. So then we're just starting to return to normality. You would have had working from home and all of that to deal with as well. So yeah, brilliant achievement. What advice would you have for other support leaders who are trying to reduce their response times? Where, Where do people even start? Yeah, so I think one element, so I'll call out a little bit of what we did differently versus what was being done before, where we started to model the total amount of work to be done on a ticket, instead of just estimating out the total amount of ticket capacity an agent could bear. Uh, And by building out an idea of this is the amount of time we need to put into solving tickets at a point in time, and then buffering that to the potential spikes we would see, uh, that's how we built out our new workforce model. It can be very tricky because a lot, a very hard question to answer, particularly around email support, which is non-live, is how much effort is actually going into the resolution of a particular inquiry, uh, because the resolution time itself on email doesn't really tell you that at all. It just tells you when the first message was sent and the last message was sent. And there's actually a lot of downtime in between that. Yeah, that is a really good point because you can't really measure for all the thinking time that goes into it and talking between departments to get resolutions or looking for advice in the knowledge centre. So that brings me on to actually my next question, which is going to be about this work to be done, which you calculate in quite a specific way, because resolution time alone, as you've just said, isn't really a reliable metric as a measure for success. So could you tell me a bit about how you calculate your preferred metric? Yeah, so the metric we use for doing this estimation of work to be done is we estimate the actual transaction time on the ticket. So my background is in industrial engineering, where time studies, big part, big element of the field, not really such a concept within support of ever actually going and doing a time study on a ticket. And it doesn't actually work because you send a reply one day, send another reply another day. But the way we formed at least this estimate of time actually being spent doing the work by the agent to resolve a particular ticket is we just looked at the deltas between time agents spent uh, on various tickets. So you have an agent working a standard eight hour shift. They're in the Zendesk queue large majority of the day. And we would just line up in time all of the comments that they sent on tickets that day. And then we would look at the difference between comment two and comment one in time and say, okay, so comment two was sent at uh, 8 a.m. when comment one was sent at 7.30 a.m. So I'm going to take the 30-minute difference and attribute that to the ticket that comment two was added onto. And then adding up all of the comments over time by the agent on that ticket 
takes us to our estimation of this was the total amount of time spent working this ticket. And then once we have the total amount of actual work time going in per ticket, we can start to form an estimate of total work time needed by the team needed for the team to resolve all the potential tickets coming in. That sounds really smart. How do you do that? Do you have some sort of tool that calculates this for you? We just do this on the back end in SQL, essentially. So we look at all of the, just the schemas created from the Zendesk data itself. So the tickets and ticket comment tables, and we, we just do this on the back end, create some smoothing for potential, potentially people being like in and out of meetings, which is not time being spent on the next comment, people being off. We don't want to count their last comment from the previous day is 16 hours of work towards the next ticket. So some, some playing with the data over time and smoothing it out and starting to basically get to output that seemed well aligned with what we understood to be going into individual tickets. And we mentioned earlier, we have a functional focus from our different support teams. And so it was interesting as well to get some confirmation in that transaction time data of, oh yes, this team does have 20%, 50% more complex or at least longer tickets to resolve than this other team. Oh, right. Yeah. So I was just going to ask whether you attributed those times to the individual ticket issue that was being solved. But of course, you've just reminded me your agents are skilled on specific areas. So you'll be able to attribute that time to that area and then see where you might need maybe more staffing or maybe more multi-skilled agents to help out with that. Yeah. And we do look at this transaction time by ticket issue type. And it is really interesting to see. I, I don't think it's revealed anything unexpected to us, but it has been a good data point to confirm expected complexity. So we have a certain type of investigation our team does when an inbound to our network isn't fully received. And it's just a very, um, very thorough process. I think mm -hmm. the current investigation flow is like something like 20 steps on the Guru card with the assortment of a lot of different tools involved there. And we got, you know, easy confirmation of, yes, the transaction time on this is distinctly higher than when someone just asks, how does pricing work? And we're able to share our FAQ docs and then share our pricing calculator. Absolutely. It can just be nice to have confirmation in some form of data on what you know, because then when you go to talk to other teams about this, other teams may speak in that language of data. So being able to say, actually, this team or this ticket type takes X times longer than this one just makes that sort of translated into as many different avenues as possible. So what does this estimated actual transaction time data allow you to do? Yeah, so it just allows us to build out a total demand view, uh, a total demand forecast in a much more direct way. So instead of forecasting just at the ticket level and then mm -hmm. saying, this is how many agents I need to address this many tickets, we're actually able to build out a view of this is our forecast of number of hours of work per day, or even as we could drill down further, number of hours of work per hour. And so then we are just staffing the number of people to meet that demand. So if we're going to have 200 hours of work in a day, eight hour shifts by agent, we just need to staff sufficient agents to cover those 200 hours of total work in the day. So then we hire a team that's going to be able to meet those higher spikes of demand over the next three to six months, let's say, if we're doing this in a rolling way, mm -hmm. uh, and then buffer that a little for people being sick, people being out, shifts, et cetera. I can imagine that would be so useful in so many ways long term as well, if you were to make any big structural changes or introduce a different service type or or if there was to be a, a big issue somewhere, you'd be able to estimate fairly accurately what impact that would have on your team capacity. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. Right now, we just did some reorganization within our support team to enable the creation of a support team that is focused on what we call our independent services. So Shopify Logistics provides not just core fulfillment, which is, I think, our intuition for e-commerce fulfillment. You know, I, the buyer, get this package at my house. But we also provide services that, you know, you probably only think of as one of these businesses, such as freight movement within the country, uh, long-term storage of full pallets of inventory, so not available directly to pick and send to the buyer, but just full pallets of storage at these alternate locations. 
And this team having this focus on these new services that we're providing, they are now quickly having to do this, this work in this estimation where we're looking and saying, now that they're just having these types of conversations, what is the average transaction time for these types of conversations versus other types of conversations they were having before? And now what is the ticket forecast specific to these types of issues versus the mixed types of issues the team was handling before? So we just carved out the team in the last month and then basically the next 30, 60 days, we're keeping a very close eye on this data to make the right adjustments for the next six to 12 months of demand that that team will face. That's fantastic. See, data just allows you to do everything really, doesn't it? Big fan. Yeah, what? I am definitely as well. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I think we're a little bit biased, you and I, but hey ho. So I'd love to know, Justin, what are your goals for, well, we're already at the end of Q1 now, but for the rest of 2023? Yeah, so some of our major goals for 2023 are still related to our acquisition and the integration of the two support teams that I now lead, the Deliver and SFN team. So really taking the learnings of these two separate, you know, historically separate functioning teams and bringing them together and taking the best of both worlds and bringing that to become shared practice on the teams. As well, continuing to really uh, get effective with how we share merchant feedback and amplify the voice of our merchant to our product teams. So bringing together these teams, streamlining their operations, getting really efficient, really effective for merchants, taking that further advocating for merchant needs and advocating effectively within this new combined environment as well. Uh, so our product teams have been changing, our, our support teams have been changing, and making sure that the voice of the merchant is still coming through really effectively through that, very top of mind for us. Absolutely, completely advocate for that. Well, it sounds like you've been super, super busy and are going to continue being very, very busy. Just from my own curiosity, obviously you were at Deliver and then Deliver was acquired by Shopify Logistics. How how are you enjoying that? How have you found that adjustment? Yeah, so I, I used a metaphor when we were first acquired by Shopify that the experience was similar to walking down the stairs and missing one step where you have this moment where you go, oh my gosh, I'm falling. But then your foot touches the very next step and you go, no, I'm just walking down the stairs. Nothing's really changed here. And I think that was the experience for me and many people as well, because we had up until that point shown up for work every day going, we are going to democratize access to amazing fulfillment, delivering logistics superpowers for all. Overall, we were showing up every single day to solve a really hard problem of e-commerce to make it easier for these merchants to succeed at building their businesses. So every day we were showing up, what do our merchants need to succeed? And that's where that, oh my gosh, an acquisition is happening, missing a step moment, then transitions into, wait, no, I'm still walking down the stairs, where that's exactly what Shopify has been doing this whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just trying to build platforms to make e-commerce and commerce overall more accessible to these businesses. And with Shopify logistics or with SFN at the time, the focus was solving this really hard problem of e-commerce, which is the logistics fulfillment aspect. So there was that moment of, oh my gosh, things are going to be so different. A big acquisition is happening. And then as the work continued, realizing nothing's really changed here. We're still trying to solve the same problem and we still have the same goal, which is to deliver a great experience to our merchants. That sounds fantastic. I wonder if having that goal and being sort of customer centric to your merchants was a really big help there because you already had this value at heart of what you really cared about as an organization which just continued across so there wasn't a real learning of changing those values it was a really important shared touch point across both shopify and deliver that we are showing up for our merchants we're solving these problems for our merchants i used to say it was one of my favorite aspects of working at deliver is that I know I could show up for work every day and sure, someone in support or product or operations might have, you know, on their OKRs or their KPIs competing uh, objectives, getting this package out in a cheaper way or, or releasing this product on a certain time frame might conflict with not generating as many tickets. But at the end of the day, that product team member, that ops team member, that support team member, we're all trying to provide a great experience to our merchants. And so I knew I would always come to a common table in conversations with other parts of the company to resolve or discuss issues facing our merchants. 
And similarly, as we've come to the table with our originally Shopify counterparts, it was that shared language as well. And when you have that shared language, you're able to dialogue and solve problems from there. Absolutely. I've spoken a lot with guests on here about how like having something you really care about as an organization, living values, it unites people and it keeps you all focused and it keeps you all happy doing what you're doing because you know you're achieving that. So really glad to hear that you've enjoyed that switch over from Deliver to Shopify Logistics and you're continuing to put the merchants at the heart of the organization. Yeah, onwards and upwards. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Justin. It's been really, really lovely chatting to you and learning about everything you've been doing. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great.